Whatever rots your socks, whatever spins your top Whatever winds your watch, whatever flips your flop Whatever turns you on, whatever flies your flag Whatever bangs your gong or whatever swings your bag Do it often but do it well Cause nobody knows and there's no way to tell When the ride ends Good morning. Welcome back to Turtle Beach. How was your week? Uh -huh. Well, mine was terrific. Thank you for asking. It's the Friday before Songkran, and uh, I love Songkran. I absolutely adore Songkran for one day. We do it for one day here on the beach road right in front of my house. This is where everybody comes to throw water at each other, and I don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> It happens in front of my house. When I'm tired of it, I step inside and shut the door. This is the beach this morning. Uh, sun coming up back there. My house is back there. I just come out on the beach in the morning. I'm not gonna do the bike ride this morning, but I came out to check on the trash. Uh, not a lot of it this time of year yet. In a month, this place will be ankle deep in trash. But uh, there's enough to make it worth coming out. Uh, I came out this morning and right in front of my house I found a pink anus. I love these. I make strings of these like Christmas tree garlands. They're getting ready to go out and fish back there. I don't know how well you can see that. We're going to go inside and I'm going to read you a story. Uh, it's been on my mind this week. There was a horrible, horrible uh, motorcycle accident on Phuket two weeks ago. And three people died, two Falang driving motorcycles, uh, each with a Thai lady on the back. And, uh, oh, I'll pick that up. I have no idea what these little guys are. Uh, there's some sort of lid off a can of motor oil or something. Uh, but they're fairly common and they're nice. They're geometric and organic at the same time. And uh, I collect them, <clears throat> use them for this and that. Anyway, this horrible motorcycle accident. Can you hear the dogs? That's how you know my neighbors are home. 6.30 in the morning. Anyway, they're very sweet people. I love them to death. Uh, at any rate, uh, <laughs> so yeah, there was this horrible motorcycle accident. It took the lives of three people, put a fourth in the hospital. And since then, there's been no report on it. And uh, I don't know how that fourth person is faring or has fared, but that fourth person who survived was an 18 year old Thai woman. Now, I don't think I am being judgmental if I say that we can assume an 18 year old Thai woman on the back of a 35 year old Russian man's motorcycle in Rawai, Phuket, at three o'clock in the morning is a participant in the commercial sex industry. We can assume, I mean, I, I, I'm sure she's a very sweet person and her family loves her and she loves her mom, but uh, I think we can assume that she was working in that industry when she met this guy and it very nearly took her life. Her involvement very nearly took her life and perhaps by now has taken her life. Uh, we're in the house now, I'm gonna open this door Listen to this. I've paid twice to have these hinges redone. Listen. You hear that? The wind just blows the, the doors right off their hinges. I'll tell you what, you gotta put up with stuff to live on the beach, you know? Here we are uh, in the studio. You can't see much. The current turtle is upside down. Uh, I'm doing his bottom right now. And this is the plinth upon which uh, that turtle will rest, and he'll go in front of my house. <clears throat> this is a plinth for the smallish turtle that I'm making for the woman who sells me my cigarettes. All right, I'm gonna turn this off a moment and set up the, uh, uh, set up the reader's corner, and I'm gonna read you a story. Hang on. All right, we're all set up. 
I'm not going to put in my tooth because I'm just going to read a story of the fake tooth makes my essence, my sibilance very, very harsh. And uh, I already didn't wear it on the beach and you've seen it a thousand times. So I'm, I'm, you're not going to be looking at my face while I read, I hope. I hope you'll treat this as a podcast or an audiobook, and you'll do something with your hands, knit, crochet, make a souffle, uh, do your makeup, uh, whatever you want to do with your hands while I'm reading. Uh, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to be vain this morning and put in a tooth, but on the subject of appearances, these are my computer glasses. Uh, I haven't worn them in a while because I bought this new monitor that's like six feet across and I don't need them to see the monitor anymore, but the last eight years of my working life, I wore these in my cubicle every single day. And I got tired of switching out with my uh, distance glasses, so when I would leave my cubicle to go to the break room or the grossing room or, or go home or whatever, I would just keep these on. I, I wouldn't switch them out because the bows get all bent up. So the people who worked with me for the last eight years in my working life, this is the Steve Ross they know. They've never seen me with those other glasses. This is the only Steve Ross they know. And, and you don't know this Steve Ross before now. Hi, I'm Steve. How you doing? Uh, all right, some, some housekeeping real quick. I want to mention this, the Bang Tong Fun Run. I don't promote things on this channel. That's not what I'm about. I promote the brand of Steve Ross. I promote the agenda that Steve is fascinating, and when Steve is talking about himself, everybody should shut up and listen. That's the only agenda I promote. There's no politics on this page. There's no products being promoted. But a very nice young lady uh, asked me to help promote her event, and I'm happy to try and do it. If you're in Pang A and you enjoy walking or running, I drove through Bang Tong to go to Pang A uh, recently to get my driver's license sorted. Uh, I'm gonna put a link to this in uh, the description of this video. Uh, if you're in Pang A and you like that sort of thing, go to it, and if you do go to it, uh, find an organizer and tell her you're there because Steve Ross suggested you go. I would love to know if I've got any sort of commercial reach at all, if I can promote anything and, and see if anybody shows up. What else? Oh, somebody sent me this. This is a big damn bag of coffee beans. This is like, what, a pound and a half? A thousand grams. 352 ounces of, of coffee beans in the bean, a solid bean. I don't know what's going on here on this bag. I don't know what, what that's about. The bag is not breached. It is not opened. Uh, something has just happened. It looks like burning. It looks like it has been burned. I, I don't know what's going on there, but I'm very grateful. I drink a fuck, I drink a bunch of coffee and guests come and visit Boontongs and uh, I make coffee for them. I'm, it, it came in a box uh, and this is, the only information on the box is the shipping label and it came from Oh, I can't, uh, Tani, one of the Tani's. Oh, I, I, I can't read it. It's too small and too Thai, but somebody sent me coffee. Thank you very much. The last bit of housekeeping while we let some Chai go by with his uh, lobster pots or crab pots today. Uh, the last bit of housekeeping, a, a fellow named Bangkok Pat uh, was throwing some shade at me this week, kind of lamely, he didn't really put his heart into it. It was just, just these randomly dashed off sentences. But one thing he said was, Steve is trying to shake off the stereotype. And I answered, what, what stereotype? I thought he was talking about, you know, the stereotypes people have thrown at me my whole life. Uh, only child of a single parent, you're a mama's boy. Uh, you're a narcissist. A liberal arts major, you have no practical skills, uh, things like that. Uh, those are the usual ones. No, turns out that I am apparently trying to shake off the stereotype of, and these are his four words, uh, grammar Nazi old monger. 
Now, I would have phrased that old grammar Nazi monger. I think that's a more sonorous phrase. But uh, uh, grammar Nazi old monger, sure, grammar Nazi, uh, yeah, I'll own that. I call myself things like that all the time. I was a medical records editor for 20 years. It was my job to tell physicians when they'd misspelled a word. You tell a man who's got eight more years of postgraduate education than you do that he spelled abducted when he meant to say adducted, and you better be right, because they will. Check it. And uh, yeah, I think that grammar, syntax, punctuation, and spelling are the four building blocks of civilization. And we are losing them rapidly because of these machines we all carry around in our pockets. Uh, the way people write on the web is just, it's terrible. It is a decline in intellect, and I think it's contributing to this uh, modern lack of civility that we all see on the web. So yeah, grammar Nazi, hell yeah. If I see a misspelling on YouTube in uh, a comment or the description or the headline, I will point it out because you can fix that. There's a little button that says edit. You can fix that, not look like a schlub, not look like you weren't paying attention in the second grade, and it won't affect your subs or your uh, views. So yeah, I will point that out. And when they correct it, I will remove my comment. Uh, if they want to argue that it's okay, because it's just YouTube, it doesn't matter how I spell or how I punctuate. No, screw you. No, you are the, the, the handmaiden of the devil and I will not tolerate it. Uh, as for old monger, yeah, I'm old, I'm 66. Uh, monger, no, my monger days ended in 1993 when I got married. Uh, so no, uh, my, my involvement in the commercial sex industry is chronicled along with every other aspect of my life. In five books, Pat, you want to know if Steve Ross is a monger, go read a book. If you don't want to read a book, then screw you. I got no time for you. Oh, and uh, uh, Pat said that uh, my only claim to fame is I am a frequent guest on Tim Newton's channel. Well, yes, I am flattered to be a frequent guest on Tim Newton's channel, but in 1993, there was a billboard over Sukhumvit Avenue with my face on it, my name on it. Yeah, you, you, get, a, you get your face on a billboard, Pat, and then we'll, we'll talk about claims to fame. I also hit uh, Jodie Foster in the head with a cardboard box hard enough to make her head bleed on the set. Uh, Jodie Foster would remember me, not, not well, but I mean, not pleasantly. She, she would not like me. Not like the memory of Steve Ross, but certainly Jodie Foster will remember Steve Ross. Uh, yeah, so those are, those are my claims to fame, not, not, not Tim Newton's channel. And I was the set decorator on a movie called Do the Right Thing, which is a very, very good movie. And I did good work on it. And it is a, a, a sad irony that at the end of the movie, Spike Lee burned my best set, Sal's famous pizzeria. He burned it to the ground. <laughs> so yeah, not Tim Newton's show. Those are not my claims to fame. Uh, another claim to fame might be, i just throw this out there. <clears throat> I don't know of any other uh, Thailand vloggers who sit down in front of a camera, fill the frame with their own face, sit down in front of a camera and tell a story for 20 minutes without a cut, without an edit, without a break, without background music, without cutaways, uh, without doing research into the BTS or non applause just me sitting here with my big fat head telling you stories about my life. 150 videos, I think, so far, how many is it? 125 something videos, uh, 12 interviews, where all I do is talk about myself, no political agenda, no Thai history, just Steve Ross. I think I'm the only person doing that and getting an audience. I get about, I don't know, four or 5,000 views, uh, which considering it's just this, I think that's pretty cool and I'm very happy to keep doing it. Uh, I don't know anybody else uh, who's doing this successfully in Thailand. Plenty of people, Pat, do what you do. You, you are the best at what you do. These sort of homework assignments where you go and you read, you, you, you uh, investigate some street corner and you get old photos and stuff. Nobody does that better than you, dude, but that sentence implies there are lots of other people doing the same thing. I don't know anybody else who's doing this successfully, 20 minute monologues without a break, without a script, without a sidekick, uh, without cutaways, without sexy women in bikinis, without TNA. No, just this uh, and, and get an audience and keep an audience. I'd like to see you try it, Pat. Like I said, I, I like it when you get out of your comfort zone and do something risky. By the way, what, whatever happened to Bangkok Karma, the, the girl with the golden arm, terrible titles, but 
Did that ever become a movie? Whatever happened with that? Anyway, I digress. This story is called Two for the Road. I wrote it. Well, there's something floating in that coffee, but I'm going to drink it. Uh, rest in peace, little one, whatever you were. Uh, yeah, I wrote this, I don't know, mid-90s, I guess. Uh, would have been, it's a thousand words. It would have been for the nation. The people who put my face on a billboard over Sukhumvit, my claim to fame. All right, Two for the Road by Steve Ross. Pardon me. <clears throat> Eduardo went home from Phuket today in royal orchid class. Oi went home in a cheap brass urn. Eduardo's leg stuck out into the aisle in a hip-to-toe plaster cast, which would annoy the flight attendants all the way from Bangkok to Rome. He also had a broken collarbone, a dislocated elbow, and a hairline fracture in his left orbit, the ring of bone that contains the eyeball. He had two stainless steel pins in his femur, which would set off airport metal detectors for the rest of his life. Oi was eight ounces of ash and a few chips of bone. Eduardo's summer vacation cost him 75,000 baht for plane tickets and hotel accommodation. The vacation cost Eduardo's father 50,000 baht for the lawyer, 50,000 baht for the police, 50,000 baht to repair the front end of the parked pickup truck that Eduardo hit head on at 60 kilometers an hour, and 20,000 baht for Oi's funeral. Eduardo's father paid 50,000 baht to Oi's family and 200,000 baht for the 450 cc motorcycle Eduardo had wrecked. Eduardo's vacation cost Oi her life and nobody concerned questioned that a two-year-old motorcycle should be worth four times as much as that life. When Eduardo hit the parked truck, the motorcycle jammed its front wheel under the truck's bumper and pivoting on the hub of that wheel, it acted like a six foot long lever. Eduardo was thrown over the truck's cab smashing his leg on the windshield in passing to land in the cargo bed. Because she was perched behind him on the extreme outer end of the lever, Oi was catapulted 50 feet before landing on her face in the middle of the road. She was probably dead by clinical standards the moment she hit the pavement, but at any rate, she slid another 10 feet before coming up hard against the curb, head first. When the embassy notified Eduardo's family of the accident, his brother Gino called a friend of a friend of a friend who imports Italian wines into Bangkok. The friend cubed, flew to Phuket, and handled all the arrangements, including the delivery of a few plates of spaghetti carbonara into the holding cell at Phuket's provincial prison, where Eduardo was held for a day after his release from hospital. Oi's mother, father, two brothers, one sister-in-law, and four nieces came down from Korat on the bus with the kids riding in the adults' laps for the entire 27-hour journey to save the cost of four more tickets. They showed up on Wednesday morning at the Gogo -Go Bar where Oi had worked, and that was the first that the management or Oi's co-workers learned about the accident which had occurred the previous Friday afternoon, Eduardo had never sent word. It was the police who wired Oi's family, taking the address from the ID card found in her purse. Eduardo waited for his court appearance in a four-star hotel, holding a bag full of ice to his face and watching Star TV with one eye. Part of the time he spent thinking of a story to tell his fiancee about how he broke his leg. Oi waited for her funeral in a locker at the local health department's cold storage facility. 
Oi's family spent two nights in Oi's room in the apartment which she had shared with three other girls. In the room, besides a bed and a vanity table, were a new TV and VCR, a lot of stuffed animals, and a dozen photo albums. Oi's father found an envelope with almost 5,000 baht in it. There was also a camera in the room, and it held a partially exposed roll of film. Oi's elder brother took the camera to the funeral, used the rest of the exposures, then took out the roll and sold the camera to one of the girls. The family left Phuket immediately after the ceremony, and when the brother had the roll of film developed in Korat, he found that three of the earlier photos had been taken in the go-go bar. They showed his little sister up on the catwalk, dressed only in high heels and panties, with a sash made of toilet paper strung over her shoulder, bearing the words, Miss Fuck Free. It was a game the girls played on slow nights. In all of the photos, Oi was wearing a lot of gold jewelry. Nobody in her family found it unusual or even unfair that the police report didn't mention any jewelry being recovered from the body. Eduardo did not attend Oi's funeral, but he sent a note. It was read out loud at the cremation by Nancy, the Farang manageress of the Gogo Bar. Oi's family could not understand a word of it, and Nancy's tie is about as good as you might expect from someone whose only experience of Thailand comes from working in a bar. But 20 of Oi's co-workers were there, and a few of them could translate the contents of the note into Isan Thai. Basically, Eduardo said that while he had only known Oi for one night, he thought that she was a good girl and a very pretty girl, and he was sorry that he had caused her death. After Nancy finished reading, Oi's mother took the note and put it in the flames. Nancy will wonder for the rest of her life if that was an effort to send the young man's good wishes along with Oi to her next life or simply an act of disgust. Yeah, well, I know which one I think it was. I don't know. If I had read this before now, I might have uh, amended the line in her room besides a bed, well, besides, I would take the S off besides, in the room beside a bed and a vanity table were a new TV and VCR and a dozen photo albums and a camera with a partially exposed roll of film. Obviously, none of that exists now. I might have boulderized this story before I read it if I had thought of it. All right, so that's it. Let me say again, there's a fun run in Panga at Bang Tong. It's about halfway, I think. Yeah, look it up. Halfway, or if you can, I don't know, there's a QR code. Can you scan that? Uh, halfway between, uh, I think, Taimung and Panga. Uh, it, anyway, uh, I don't run. <laughs> uh, I ride the bicycle in the morning. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fun event, I think. And uh, I, I hope they get a lot of people. That is it. You have a terrific week. Thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, share. This is the best time of my week, bar none. I very much appreciate your attention. Uh, Kun Pat, yeah, grammar Nazi, not an old monger. Read my books, then you'll know. And if you don't read books, I don't have time for you. All right, I'm gonna stick a few things, whatever's in the phone. I don't remember what I shot this week, but I'll stick a couple things on the end of this and wish you a great Songkran. Uh, stay wet if that's what you want to be. Stay dry if that's what you want to be. Sunday, Grumpy Old Men, where I am a frequent guest on Tim Newton's channel. And I suppose that's my claim to fame. All right, have a great week. Bye. I am back from Panga, back on Turtle Beach. That is Lone Tree up there where I'm headed. That's where I've come from. And here is a turtle track. This is a lady turtle. <laughs> Daddy turtles don't ever come ashore. 
Uh, and Mama Turtle has come up here in the last few days and built a nest. And whether or not she deposited any eggs in this nest, I don't know, but someone's been here before me. There are tracks, human tracks, coming up from the wet sand. So somebody has come and investigated this uh, and they've walked around it enough to wipe out her tracks. So uh, I don't need to report it, but I wanted to show you, somebody had said, hey, they shouldn't let those fishermen ride their motorcycles on the beach because they might drive over a baby turtle. Well, you can't see it from here, but down there is where they ride on the beach, where the sand is hard. Well, the turtle has to come all the way up here to lay her eggs, right? Because otherwise the tide will come in and take the eggs away. So there's no way anybody's gonna drive over a baby turtle or a turtle egg. Uh, yeah, and uh, whether or not there were eggs in here, I don't know, uh, there's no way of telling. Uh, lady turtles that come build nests, whether or not they've got eggs to lay. Sometimes they lay eggs that have not been fertilized because she hasn't been hanging out with any dudes. Or sometimes it's partially fertilized eggs, partially unfertilized eggs. I think very rarely is it all viable fertilized eggs. But at any rate, that's what a uh, turtle uh, nest looks like. And here's how you know it was a turtle's nest. Uh, that that pattern, it's either a, a turtle, a sea turtle, or the world's biggest hermit crab. I'm going to vote for turtle. All right, that's all the news from Turtle Beach. Have a great day. Somebody said he wanted to see the big gears and cogs at the remain of the tin dredging. So here we are at the remain of the tin dredging. That's the ocean down there. That's my finger taking focus, literally. And these are the big iron cogs and gears. Uh, public restrooms, if the water is running, if it's been turned on. That's deepest, darkest Africa in there. Something like 30 clicks of mangroves from there to uh, the naval station at Top Lamu. These are some more of the big cogs. They litter the landscape. And I have been told that the only way to get them out would be helicopter. I don't know why you couldn't just take them down the road, but on a truck, but uh, apparently it's not worth, uh, what you would get in scrap is not worth moving it. Uh, but this is, this is how important tin was. You know, uh, Phuket was, at the beginning of World War II, the world's fifth largest producer of tin. Uh, it was a big deal around here. Das Tai Mun, end of the tin mine. We take our name literally from that industry. Look at all this lovely old barn wood. Boy, you could make coffee tables out of that. Sell it in Manhattan for thousands of dollars. <laughs> All right, the remain of the tin dredging and the big iron cogs. Whatever shaves your sheep, whatever bakes your glam, whatever digs your feet, whatever smokes your ham, whatever blows your nose, whatever chews your bone. Whatever squirts your hose, whatever sings your song, do it after but do it well. Nobody knows and there's no way to tell. When you ride and this dead tree be doing down to the you can never put it out, do it in that game. Shoot it, shoot it, shoot it up, shoot.